So my name is Jeff Miller. I'm the Roger and Linda Hedrick Chair in Holder and Cancer Therapeutics. And part of my job is really to think about cancer and how to treat it every day in the past 20 years or so that I've been here. I'm also a professor of medicine in the Division of Hematology, Oncology, and Transplantation, and the Deputy Director of the Masana Cancer Center. I'm also a bone marrow transplant physician. I still take care of patients. I do research. I do phase one studies. And we really try to help patients every day as we do our laboratory research and how to translate that into the clinic. Um, I would like to introduce to you our panel today, who's sitting to my right. Dr. Frank Andre is program co-director for carcinogenesis and chemo prevention for the Masana Cancer Center, and associate professor in the Department of Otolaryngology and Head and Neck Surgery. Dr. Michael Veneris is a friend and colleague and associate professor, a professor of pediatrics at the Masana Cancer Center. Dr. Larry Pease is a professor of biochemistry and molecular biology and immunology. He is also cancer immunology and immunotherapy program lead at the Mayo Clinic Cancer Center. Dr. Manish Patel is an assistant professor at the Masana Cancer Center. And Dr. James Robinson is assistant professor at the Hormel Institute and the section leader of, signal, of cell signaling and tumorogenesis. So if I could get my slide back up, please. The next one. OK, thank you. So we've been very excited about novel therapies. Um, what we've talked about is the specificities of these therapies, how we can make therapies magic bullets. You know, we're hearing from our patients that they don't like the effects of chemotherapy. They don't like the side effects of radiation therapy. And we're trying to get very much more specific, only enhancing the cancer cells without attacking normal tissues. And you're going to hear from my colleagues of various levels of interest that they have had in these areas to make cancer therapy more specific. Um, we know that there are different acronyms that these new therapies are taking on. Cars, tanks, hanks, bikes, and trikes. And you have to have something very cute when you propose a new therapy to have people pay attention to what you're doing. There are some very provocative things that I think are addressed, and we heard of the, some of them in the previous session. What is the cost of cancer therapy, and what will the market, we being the patients, the payers, the healthcare providers, what are we willing to accept for the, cancer, for the cost of the benefit of new therapies? Um, who should foot the bill for progress? I think that's one of the things that we're all trying to understand from the cancer moonshot, both locally and at the national level. We know that we cannot do this alone as a single state. We know that we depend on taxpayer dollars. We depend on funding. We depend on cooperation with big pharma. And I think we do need more cooperation with third party payers. Um, I would like the uh, panelists to, and I welcome you all to think about questions by Twitter or more traditional microphone means that are scattered throughout the audience, um, to really think about the issues about the barriers to translational research and how do we accelerate progress, because really that's why we're all here today. How do we accelerate progress? And we're really thinking about how do we provide better patient care and how do we make cancer less of a problem than it is today. So with that brief introduction, um, Frank, if you would step up, please, and give your introduction. OK. Step up or? I I'm sorry. Go OK. Ahead. OK. All right. <laughs> I'm uh, Frank Andre. I'm an ear, nose, and throat surgeon here at the university. Uh, came here to train in 89. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was at a government peer review grant meeting, and uh, in the three days of the meeting, I had gotten various texts and uh, emails and whatnot from my nurses, and by the end of the three-day meeting, I had coordinated the care for chemotherapy and radiation therapy for three new patients who were diagnosed the week before with uh, human papillomavirus-associated uh, stage four oropharyngeal carcinoma. So it's a real, uh, it's a real problem disease. And, uh, but unlike uh, some of the moonshot engineers who were sitting skeptically, perhaps, with slide rules attached to their belts in 1960, 
I'm a little bit more hopeful that this is a moonshot that really could occur in 10 years. I'm not going to be on the skeptical side of this as well. What's interesting about HPV, human papillomavirus, represents about 100 to 150 viruses, of which about 10 or fewer are associated with high risk, high risk meaning that they cause cancer. Uh, right now in the United States, there's about three diagnoses an hour of HPV-associated cancers. So that's quite a bit. That's uh, close to 40,000 a year. When I first started in my, my medical training, mouth and throat cancers were associated and relegated to people who were heavy smokers and maybe people who used excess alcohol. And we'd have a very occasional patient who was non-risk factor that would get one of these HPV-associated throat cancers. And, uh, it's, it's, and, and you can't, it wasn't even diagnosed in those days. And now, last, just last a couple weeks ago, I had three patients. So it does represent both a preventable and treatable cancer. What's preventable about it is that, uh, is that the HPV vaccines are probably going to do a great job of eliminating it, provided that they're widely uh, taken now, and that provided, provided that they're widely taken by, uh, by both genders. There is very interesting work here at the University of Minnesota in not just a bench-to-bedside translational mode, but also from a public health perspective. And it's a very unique thing uh, here at the Cancer Center and here at the university. There's a group that's called Minnesota HPV. It's an amalgamation of professionals. And they want to create and mobilize networks of, of people to make sure that vaccine, vaccination is embraced. So it's this problem of this uh, that was spoken about before, this uh, concept that some people just don't want to take vaccines. But they're studying also ways to try and make the vac vaccines more embraceable. That's very, very important. And, uh, and they also can do education about the HPV-associated malignancies that occur uh, across the citizens of our state. What's also interesting is that at least five separate departments here at the university treat HPV-associated malignancies. And uh, it's not just from a therapeutic standpoint. It's not just, oh, we're going to do surgery on this and then we're going to follow it with radiation. But all of those uh, departments are really embracing the concept that we need to go out and make sure that it starts from the get-go, that you really do a good job of, uh, of, of trying to get people vaccinated. Here, I'm an ear, nose, and throat doctor talking about uh, vaccinating against cervical cancer. I think that there's a broad, there's a broad uh, concept that we really want to make this happen. Uh, the departments are the ob department, of course, uh, our department, the otolaryngology department, the urology department, general surgery, and dermatology all have, uh, have some stake in this with HPV-associated uh, malignancies. And uh, finally, what's interesting uh, from a more therapeutic standpoint is that the HPV virus is, does not mutate as bad as tobacco does for the mouth and throat cancers anyways. And uh, there's ways to try to subvert some of the things that the HPV virus can do with either natural products or certain types of experimental therapies to normalize the genetic program of those cells a lot easier than we're able to see with, uh, with a lot of the smoking-associated throat cancers that I treat. And uh, there's at least a couple of early indications that we're able to do that to make maybe radiation much more successful, maybe make chemotherapy more successful as well. So it's, uh, it's nice to be involved at an institution uh, that has such a broad concept of trying to eliminate this group of malignancies, and uh, I'll stop there. Mike? Uh, so, my name is Michael Verneris. I'm a professor of pediatrics. Uh, I'm a hematologist, I'm an oncologist, and I'm a bone marrow transplant physician. Uh, I'm the director of the leukemia program uh, in the Department of Pediatrics, and I'm the vice chair of research in the Department of Pediatrics. Um, <clears throat> Uh, my main focus really is uh, trying to understand how to target the immune system uh, to recognize cancer. Uh, and as a pediatrician, I kind of put up this very famous uh, book uh, uh, by Margaret Wise Brown, uh, Goodnight Moon, and kind of uh, adulterated it to Goodnight Moonshot. Um, but, but really the reason why I put this this uh, graphic up there was to, to remind me to explain to the audience that Every day in this country, about 40 children will be diagnosed with cancer. So just right before you read that book and you get your child out of the bathtub, you feel a mass in the child's abdomen, or as uh, the toddler or the young child is getting out of the pool and feels a twinge of pain, or the, the young boy gets off the lacrosse field and starts to limp, 
that's the way it all begins for these children. And, um, you know, it's a really long, hard road. <clears throat> the um, majority of children are actually cured with cancer. And um, the reason for that is uh, for a variety of different reasons, but certainly one of which is because uh, pediatricians have really worked hard to uh, work together and to to uh, test therapies um, for children. And I think the statistic is somewhere around 88% of all kids diagnosed with cancer are treated on clinical trials. And so the first bullet on my slide is, should children be research subjects? And, and I think the answer is a resounding yes. And, and you know, many people in all sorts of different governmental or regulatory or hospital type positions are paternalistic and don't want children to be on clinical trials necessarily, but this is the way we move things forward, through basically through this iterative approach of basically trying something new or inserting something new or taking something out to either enhance or reduce uh, efficacy or, or the activity of a cancer uh, study. And, and the reason why I raise this point here is because I would implore all of you guys, everybody in the audience, to go to clinicaltrials.gov for a moment, and, and that's where all the clinical trials are listed. Every clinical trial in the U.S. and abroad needs to be uh, listed there. And just look at the inclusion criteria. And one is always age, and almost always it's greater than 18. So that, with somebody earlier talked about discrimination. That is a form of discrimination. If kids can't get access to new and powerful drugs, that is a problem for these children. And this is something that, that, that I think we need to continually be aware of. Um, the second bullet on my slide is really, what are the differences between adults and children? Um, and there are huge differences. The types of cancers that children get, adults tend not to get, and vice versa. And in fact, the, the genetic changes in those cancer cells are different. Therefore, if we're targeting the immune system, or using the immune system to target these various cancers, it will be very different. And so the results that you get in adults may not apply to children, and vice versa. As well, children have an active and developing and growing immune system to whereas most of the adults, unfortunately, we, our immune system is kind of static. I mean, it still changes, it still adapts, but it's not adapting and changing the way children do. So in fact, immune-based therapies may be much more effective in children than in adults. And then the last bullet is, has immune therapy been used in children and does it work? And so I think uh, along those lines, probably one of the very first immune therapies was a study that was pioneered by the Children's Oncology Group looking at a, a group of patients with neuroblastoma. And, and some of these children got an antibody called C1418, and some of them didn't. And neuroblastoma is a horrible disease, has about a 30% survival in children who are diagnosed with advanced disease. And with that um, uh, addition of that antibody and some other interventions which augmented immune responses, we were able to increase that to 40 or 50%, and now we're up probably to around 70%. Likewise, um, there's another uh, uh, therapy that Dr. Miller alluded to earlier called CARS, or chimeric antigen receptors. These are basically uh, uh, taking a piece of, of another protein, kind of attaching it to a cell and training that cell to recognize cancer. And these have been profoundly um, effective in children with chemotherapy refractory leukemia. So these are patients that basically have weeks to live, and now they've turned these patients into not only undergoing, uh, achieving remission, but having long-term success. And um, we're participating in some of these studies here, and it's incredibly gratifying to see uh, what's happening with these patients. Patients who probably wouldn't be alive, but also uh, last week, last Thursday, I saw one patient who basically now will, re you know, will, will not be infertile and will be able to have kids um, in the future. And so I think we're at a truly at a watershed moment where we can kind of start thinking about either augmenting our, our current armamentarium of chemotherapy, radiation, surgery, along with immune therapy, or by actually removing some of these things like chemotherapy and radiation and substituting them with immune therapy. Not in there. Thank you, Mike. Larry? Yeah, thank you uh, for having us here today. Um, I'm Larry Pease. I'm a basic scientist uh, at the Mayo Clinic. 
And I'm also, uh, in addition to being a program director for the Cancer Center in uh, Immunology and Immunotherapies, I'm also the uh, director of a broader center of immunology and immune therapies that, that cuts across diseases uh, outside cancer. So um, I'm a little bit envious of the engineers who uh, had the slide, slide rules on their belt that uh, were trying to put a, a, a people on the moon and <clears throat> the original moonshot uh, because I think that uh, the, the complexity of the kind of question that, that we're dealing with, in addition to all the physics that we have to, to, have to understand in order to uh, engineer the right kinds of solutions, we're dealing with unbelievable, incredible genetic diversity at both the uh, level of the individuals who we're treating, all, everybody in this room, highly genetically diverse from each other, uh, and, and in the cancers that they develop. I want to applaud the first panel for, uh, and all the people they represent for thinking about ways to prevent this, th these diseases from happening in the first place, because that's really where the, the low-hanging fruit is. And if we can do that, that would be wonderful. But once the cancers have, have developed, we're faced with um, a situation where we're trying to treat a highly diverse population. Everybody has a different kinds of immune systems. They respond to different degrees. Um, the cancers that they have are, are plastic. Um, they have the capacity to mutate. They have the capacity to um, evade their therapies. Uh, and so our challenge is, is really to devise strategies that take into account this incredible genetic diversity on both sides of the equation. And so at, at Mayo Clinic, that's kind of the thing that we're trying to do. And we're also very um, cognizant of the fact that we're dealing with people and that um, these are our patients. And so we've tried to integrate the science of trying to understand, A, how does the immune system work? B, what, what kinds of things can we do to activate the immune system in a manner that they, it can see cancer? Because like was mentioned before, this is a very highly effective targeted therapy. And finally, um, you know, what, what, what kinds of, 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 uh, of mechanisms are, are in place that the cancer's using uh, to evade the tumor, which include both down regulation of the immune system and um, mutation and evasion of, of uh, ther therapies. And so our challenge really is to put all of these things together. We have incredible teams that we put together of scientists and clinicians, caregivers, uh, the, the uh, study coordinators uh, that we employ in order to try to bring all of these things together in a, in a humane way because we're studying people. Um, so some of the exciting things that are going on at Mayo uh, include uh, uh, work that we're doing to try to understand the molecular mechanisms that, uh, that, that the immune cell uses and immune cells use in order to um, regulate immunity. And uh, the realization came through, through studies of patients that some of these newly discovered mechanisms are being co-opted by cancers in order to keep tumor at, at at bay, and these discoveries have now led to checkpoint inhibitors, some of the more very exciting work that people are hearing in the press about uh, treating patients who essentially, you know, five years ago would not survive, who are now surviving with, with normal lives. We're also recognizing that there are normal, other normal uh, processes that um, prevent the immune system from recognizing cancer cells and, and, and uh, being able to, to attack them. And we're, and we're trying to then figure out ways to either turn those off or to activate the immune system in a manner where we can overcome the negative regulatory mechanisms that are in place. One of the exciting uh, observations that a number of us at Mayo have made is that viruses are particularly adept at activating the immune system uh, in a way uh, that, that can overcome some of the barriers in, in cancer. And uh, so uh, there's a, a series of, of studies going on to, to try to employ viruses as, as an adjuvant, if you will, as an act, immune activator in order to, to target this tumor, uh, tumor cells. Another aspect of it is, is that, that the tumor cells are, are, are diversifying, as I said. Uh, once you attack one of them, another one will grow out. So we're trying to figure out ways to incorporate these activation mechanisms where we're getting a broad spectrum of, of tumor cells being recognized so that we can ablate the entire population without it being able to get away. And finally, we're, we're, there's a series of studies by a number of different investigators who are looking at 
what is the diversity in the human population? How can we determine who's going to respond to what vaccine, what, what uh, immunotherapy strategy? And finally, the, the big thing that I think that, that uh, a place like Mayo Clinic brings to this fight is the capacity to bring together scientists, clinicians, uh, care providers, and the patients together uh, in order to get this uh, done. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Manish, it was a great introduction of viral therapy, so yeah. take it away. Yes, thank you. My, uh, my name is Manish Patel. I'm a medical oncologist here and a, um, also a laboratory scientist. We've been focused on using um, viruses to treat lung cancer in the laboratory, um, and uh, we've been, been uh, really uh, proud to uh, be able to collaborate with the Mayo Clinic uh, with, uh, with their team on uh, bringing some of these, uh, these viruses to uh, treat lung cancer in particular. Um, and many of the observations that we've observed in lung cancer models have been now been, um, been shown in, with a variety of different viruses and uh, in a variety of different tumor types. Uh, so basically what we've observed, you could say as an example for how viruses might work, um, generally speaking. And when we first started this uh, back in uh, 2008, um, we really did not have a lot of evidence that immunotherapy was a very effective um, treatment for, uh, for lung cancer. And so our paradigm when we first started was that viruses, and there are certain, certain viruses that are oncolytic, that is they preferentially infect tumor cells, uh, either because they naturally do so based on some biochemical reasons, or um, they've been engineered to do so, so they uh, have been molecularly engineered so that they are preferential uh, for tumor cells and uh, don't affect normal cells. And the idea there was that you introduce the virus into the tumor, it replicates, kills the cancer cell, and then goes on to spread to uh, surrounding tumor cells. Uh, without affecting the normal host, and that in, its, in and of itself is an exciting idea that has been uh, that's been demonstrated um, in the laboratory, and in some cases in in uh, clinical situations as well. But what we've become what we've come now to appreciate is that, uh, as uh, Dr. Pease mentioned, is that uh, viruses uh, as pathogens are also uh, great tools uh, to alert provoke, attract uh, the immune system to the tumor microenvironment. Um, and what we've observed in our lung cancer models is that when we do uh, introduce the virus into the tumor, that we see a really dramatic effect on the infiltration of immune cells into the tumor microenvironment. And probably most something that we were somewhat surprised about is that it's not just in the local tumor microenvironment, but in fact can it, uh, attract attention system-wide system into the, uh, into the entire mouse or person uh, to uh, uh, activate tumor-specific uh, uh, immune cells. And it does this probably by, we think, probably by um, creating an inflamed tumor microenvironment. Um, what we've observed as well is that it can also increase, uh, so one of the things that cancers try to do to evade this uh, um, uh, immune uh, response is to I increase uh, proteins that are that uh, suppress the immune system, such as uh, PDL1. And we now have, uh, as, D as uh, Dr. Pease mentioned, have checkpoint inhibitors that inhibit PD1 or PDL1 uh, that we that have been dramatically successful, but they've only a affect a small percentage of patients. And so we think that by using the using our virus in combination with checkpoint blockade, that we can really improve. Uh, the effects uh, uh, improve the response to uh, these uh, uh, immune checkpoint uh, inhibitors uh, more broadly and uh, really affect uh, patient, uh, patient care uh, dramatically. Um, and there, we're you know, real excited that in the past year we've seen the first FDA approval of an oncolytic virus, uh, uh, herpes simplex virus. Uh, that does largely the same thing. So it's a replicating virus, and it also can stimulate the immune system. And now we're seeing combinations with uh, checkpoint blockade for melanoma that are showing some, some real, uh, real promise. And so we hope to extend these, uh, these findings to lung cancer, and we're planning on starting a, a clinical trial, hopefully uh, early next year. I'll, I'll stop there. Great. Thank you. Hello. 
Uh, my name is James Robinson, and I'm head of the cell signaling and tumor genesis section at the Hormel Institute. Uh, my lab works on the development of cancer. We use traditional animal models, transgenic models, and patient samples. Now, back to first principles, what is cancer? Well, cancer is a malignant growth of cells. To allow these cells to grow in a malignant manner, key genes are mutated, genes that stop growth and allow the growth of cells with a great number of mutations, which should otherwise die. There are other mutations that occur that drive rapid growth of these cells. The third thing that has to happen is these cells have to escape immune surveillance, because ordinarily these would be cleared by the immune system. Now, traditional therapies, well, why does surgery fail? Especially for melanoma, surgery fails because the cancer metastasizes from the original site and simply can't be removed. Surgery is still the best form of treatment for melanoma if you catch it early enough, or prevention, which involves avoiding sunburn and sun-damaged skin and sun-tanning beds. But the, the other forms of traditional therapy, radiotherapies fail in melanoma, particularly because because these cancers are highly mutated, they have mutations in the genes that sense DNA damage, including from the radiotherapy itself. So melanoma, for instance, is particularly insensitive to radiotherapy. And chemotherapies fail. Typically, broad-spectrum chemotherapies fail because the cancer itself is uh, not sufficiently sensitive to the therapeutics compared to normal cells in the patient. So the patient would simply be either too sick or be killed by any chemotherapeutic treatment that has so far been tried. So we're moving today, we know a lot more cancer than we did even 10 years ago. We have sequenced most major cancers, genomes. We know all the molecular changes or many of the molecular changes that occur. We know how they're involved in the growth and development of the cancers. So we use targeted therapies or we've tried targeted therapies against key growth pathways. Unfortunately, these typically fail because again, these pathways are important in most cells in the body at the same time. So it's impossible to, or very hard to repress them for long enough, significantly enough, to kill the tumor cells. Very recently, or just a few years ago now, uh, inhibitors against specific mutations, genetic mutations in melanoma and cancer, particularly vemurafenib, which is an inhibitor of mutant BRAF, uh, was developed. And that is very effective in the short term clearing a good proportion of patients' melanoma metastases. A patient can be uh, literally very sick, almost at death's door, and this drug, bemurafenib, can cause complete, almost complete regression of the melanoma. In our lab, we use animal models to model what goes on in these tumors, because unfortunately, four to six months later, they almost all come back. So the patient almost has complete remission, and then the tumors come back. Uh, we've discovered, using animal models and using this drug, that what basically what happens is because the cancer cell has mutations in key tumor suppressor pathways and growth pathways, and not every cell can be killed because it is a very heterogeneous, a very mix, there are very different mutations within each cell in that cancer. They're not all clonogenic. That if they will develop further mutations and, those, and the original inhibitors will no longer work. Now, um, in, and in our animal model, what we find is uh, that the tumors that come back have a great number more mutations in them than the initial tumors at the time of treatment. So because it's cloning eluding, uh, evolving and because there are many different original uh, different mutations in the starting cancer, it adds to the complexity of the cancer. Now, immunotherapy in melanoma has been the greatest advance recently. Uh, well, PD-1 inhibitors have been mentioned. There's also CTL-4 um, uh, inhibitors. Um, and what I want to say here is that these, I'm trying to say, they de-repress the repression of the immune system to allow the immune system to respond to the cancer. Now, melanoma uh, is actually one of the most highly mutated cancers, as is microsatellite unstable colon cancer. Both these cancers respond best to immunotherapy, um, among other cancers. And, within melanoma and microsatellite unstable colorectal cancer. Uh, melanoma has particularly has a high mutation rate because of the UV damage initially, and microsatellite unstable cancer has uh, inactivation of DNA repair genes, so they're full of mutations, and they respond best to immunotherapy depending on the mutation load. So uh, I, as a transgenic animal researcher, uh, uh, who's interested in how melanoma forms and how it grows and how it spreads, what we're interested in doing is taking what we've learned from these models and moving these ideas and combining them with immunotherapies. 
Uh, and we think that what is particularly interesting is that maybe we can actually enhance the mutation load with traditional treatments, so these melanomas might respond better to the targeted immunotherapies. Because these immunotherapies themselves, as again, they respond better to tumors with a high mutation burden. And in the case of the, the BRAF melanomas, the resistant tumors after treatment have a much higher mutation burden than the initial tumors. However, the patients, the, there are also, there are many clinical issues to deal with how the patient is actually doing at the time, but this is one avenue of investigation. The real difficulty with, for my perspective, working on um, immunotherapy is traditional modeling of cancers done either in cell culture or in mouse models, none of which are necessarily very useful for immunotherapy because you need an intact immune system. You can't simply take a human tumor and graft it onto a mouse without an immune system to study it. So that, to study it properly, we need much more, compl com um, much more expensive and slightly more complicated mouse models where you actually graft a human immune system into a mouse and then you graft on a human tumor and then you can test um, how you would how we would modulate any therapies, how you can improve them, how you could combine them with their other therapies. And um, so that was my point for this table's discussion today, and I'm interested in hearing the comments from the other uh, panel members and the audience. Okay, thank you very much. So if you can please line up or figure out how to sign on Twitter, which I don't know how, but <laughs> please line up and answer questions, and somebody will tell me how to get those Twitter questions. The, the one thing you've heard, I think you've seen that we're very passionate about what we do. Um, you know, the, the one thing, and, I'll, um, and we'll get to the questions, but as you see, we have basic scientists, we have clinical investigators, and we have some of us are both, and we have this very, very complicated black box that we call translational reserves, research. And that's taking some basic idea from the laboratory and trying to get it to the clinic. It is very, very complicated, as you've heard from some of this. And I, you know, as you think about it, this is what I think the moonshot is. How do we make this go quicker? How do we build in synergy? How do we not replicate what somebody else is doing? And how do we work together as partners? So why don't we start off, Tucker, with the first question. Is this on? OK, it is. I'm Tucker will be in Vice Dean for Research the Medical School. So Jeff, I'm going to kind of start with a question directed to you and then to your, uh, to your colleagues up there. Yeah. So um, as those of us who are in the business of biomedical research and cancer research know, uh, this is to some degree we've entered the golden era of immunotherapy uh, with the extraordinary wealth of information driven by basic science that's now applied in ways, Jeff, I think even 10 years ago we didn't think would be possible. So if you take a drug and a disease that you, you know well, Gleevec to treat chronic myelocytic leukemia. Yeah. When the drug first came out, and it's a drug, it was extremely expensive, and then as more patients are treated and there's greater success, the drug goes off patent, generics come out, the price can go down. Okay. Now, cell-based therapy, from my perspective, there's never going to be a generic. Yeah. And so I wonder if you'd address the question of how on earth we're possibly going to be able to bring that therapy to a broad spectrum of patients yeah. given the extraordinary expense that we can appreciate firsthand because we make these types of cells at the university. Right. Yep. So, Tucker, as you know, it's an excellent question. It's one of the key points that I put on my slide. You know, what is the cost that third-party payers or patients or society is willing to bear as part of healthcare? I think it's very complicated. I could tell you what the scientific goal in this cell therapy field is try to get to the issue of off-the-shelf cells. So, you know, what Tucker mentioned is the current TCAR therapy that has been overwhelmingly been successful in pediatric patients with ALL, in patients with acute B, you know, malignancies, is incredibly expensive. We think that the cost of one single dose of those cells may be a quarter to a half million dollars. And if we generalize this to all the cancer therapy, it's not gonna be remotely possible that we're gonna be able to afford this as a society. You know, we've made much, much progress in getting, very, in getting cells to propagate long-term. The question is, can we overcome this personalized individual medicine aspect 
where you know your cancer can only be with your cells and we have to gene modify your cells, we have to culture them for three weeks, we have to get them to pass through all these regulatory issues that cells have to have before they infuse. So I think the, you know, the way that I look at this individualized therapy myself, and then I'll open it up to the panelists, is this is really proof of concept. We now know that the immune system is incredibly powerful to attack pounds of tumor. Now we have to work on, I guess, the efficiency stage. Can we generalize this? Can we make cells in a bottle to take off the shelf that can be used for at least a group of patients and not have it be so individualized? Does anybody want to add to that comment? Uh, um, so, Tucker, it's a great question. I've never even considered what you just raised. Um, and, and, and no, truly. And so, so a couple points to the to the question. So the first thing is is that that the, these T car therapies for pediatric ALL and adult ALL and lymphoma will probably follow relatively quickly. Will likely get FDA approval within the next year. I mean, it's it's really profound what has happened. I mean, these are patients who have no other options, and 90 percent of patients are going into remission. Many of them with long term durable remissions and likely cures. Um, so it will be FDA approved. And so as part of the approval, I would, I would guess that, that those will roll off um, onto a generic market eventually, although I have no idea what will happen. It's a really interesting question. Um, you know, and, and as far as the, the scale up, uh, you know, our experience with this um, you know, the drug companies now are moving into this space. They are actually taking the cells from patients. They're being shipped halfway the across the country. They're being produced. They're being shipped back. We're infusing them. But the, but the amount of effort that this is taking to actually implement is, is huge. And, and I'm not sure how we're going to actually keep up with the demand. And, and there, there is, there's, you know, people, we're now planning a randomized study where patients get diagnosed with high-risk leukemia. They'll be randomized to get chemotherapy or get chemotherapy and just a little bit, uh, just a little bit of chemotherapy and then these cells. And, and that may very well be a winner and it may just be an entire game changer. And I suspect that we will one day say, I remember when kids with leukemia got chemotherapy. It's, that, that's what's going to happen. So, and next question, can and I, we'll can I, alternate can I add here. To that or no? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, so give yeah. a brief comment, and then we, because we okay. only have ten minutes left. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, so anyway, yeah. So I, I agree that it, that we're we're very in, in the very early stages, but I think some of the answers to this is that um, once the principles are demonstrated, then innovation comes to streamline. And so there may be mechanisms to achieve the same result without growing cells and culture, without doing these other things. And, and so viral, viral introduction of genes into the immune system and the appropriate lymph nodes in the right site to drive the responses to, to get targeted therapies is a possibility where innovation studies at Mayo are, are, are in, going in this direction that could streamline this happen off the shelf, but capitalize on all the work that's been uh, done before. Thanks. And please identify yourself before you ask your question. Thank you, Jeff. Um, Jaime Modiano, and I'm the director of the Animal Cancer Care and Research Program here at the University of Minnesota. And so um, it's interesting, the connection between the first two panels, because we're looking at um, them almost in isolation, right? We're looking at how do we prevent cancer in the patients of tomorrow, and how do we treat cancer in the patients of today? And when we think about the immune system in patients who have cancer, we're, we're already behind the eight ball, right? And we have to do some really harsh uh, manipulations that actually increase risk for other side effects. And so th there's a lot of comments that I could make about the stuff that's going on in, in our program, but many people probably don't, um, don't know that dogs and cats get cancer at similar rates that, than people. And so we're doing some really innovative collaborations with the Cancer Center and other units at the university to bring basic and clinical research into our companion animals. And there's actually a virotherapy um, clinical trial going on with, in dogs with cancer right now in collaboration with the Mayo. There's a lot of things going on. But have you guys really considered the concept that we can use all of the really interesting genomic data we're getting access to and, and using that in cancer prophylaxis, because that's really one of the areas where we're going into, really trying to understand the mutational spectra. 
and, and use that mutational specter to use dogs as proof of principle that we can prevent cancer, much like we do with HPV. But instead of vaccinating them against the virus, vaccinating them against these prevalent mutations that will happen in the cancer and really be able to delay or prevent that. So what's your thought on really taking the immunotherapy to the healthy individual as opposed to waiting until the individual actually has cancer? Larry, why don't you go first on this one, and then Mike. Let's fight over it, no. Yeah, so, so I think that you know, just the point that I would like to make on, on that question is that uh, we don't, you know, we, we know some things about the normal immune response, but there's a lot of things we don't know. There's probably way more things we don't know than we know, okay? And so a lot of times, in terms of policy and, and, and funding for, for cancer research, we focus on, you know, does this directly apply to the disease or not? But the discoveries like the checkpoint inhibitors did not come as a consequence of trying to understand how we're going to treat cancer. It came as a, as a consequence of trying to understand how the immune system functions. And so, um, you know, in, in these kinds of studies is where I see the answers coming to your question, is that understanding the nature of what the immune system does and what it recognizes will be able to figure out why some people have an immune system that doesn't clear the cancers and why some people don't. And that's where the kind, that's where the innovation will come. Mike, you want to add? Uh, I'll just say quick, you know, as a vet, Jaime, um, you know, many of the inbred dogs come with papers, right? They come with a lineage. They come, you know, the mother, the father, the mother's father, the mother, so on. And so I, I think that it's, it's, it's fantastic and really interesting to think that knowing the lineage and knowing the genetic makeup of these dogs, you, you might actually be able to succeed in preventing cancer by, by knowing genetics. I think in humans, though, we're all outbred, um, and so we're very different, and, and, and many of us, at least. Uh, <laughs> uh, just joking. Uh, uh, but, but I think it will be, uh, uh, you know, we will likely learn something from the dogs, but how, or, or pets, uh, but how well we'll be able to translate that to humans might still be a large challenge, speculation. Yeah. Next question, please. Yeah, hello. My name is Lukman Hussein. I'm a pediatric research intern at Children's Hospital and Clinic of Minnesota. This question is geared more toward Dr. Michael Verners. You asked at the start of the panel, uh, why should children be, what's it called, research subjects? To answer your question, first of all, the field of chemotherapy would not be pioneered if it wasn't for children due to Dr. Ferber doing clinical trials on children with acute leukemia, which was the reason why chemotherapy was pioneered. And my question to you is the funding of childhood cancers, specifically when there are cancers such as DIPG, diffuse intrinsic uh, pontine glioma being handed down, which is technically a death, a death sentence because the cancer is inoperable. And chemotherapy is not ineffective. The best treatment that we can give is palli uh, palliative treatment, which is just to reduce the pain. And then we still cannot get childhood cancers to be as well funded in what's it called correlation with its adult counterpart. How can we create more awareness for that? Uh, you leave me speechless. Um, I mean, you know, I mean, honestly, I think your point's well taken. And, and um, you know, and on the one hand, there are there is definitely a recognition at the national level at the NIH, uh, and there are pediatrics, uh, you know. Uh, review committees and, and stuff like that in terms of funding opportunities. There's Alex's Lemonade Stand, there's St. Baldrick's, but all of these are, are grassroots organizations that fund pediatric re cancer research. But I agree with you. I mean that, that there are many, many more adults with cancer, and, and that's one of the reasons why I, I, I raised the points I did on my slide, because I, I really believe that, that um, you know, sometimes kids get left behind, especially with some of these new agents. I mean, just look at, like, we've heard the word PD-1. Just Google PD-1 and, and pediatric trials. There's almost no pediatric trials on these drugs that are profoundly um, uh, expensive, and you can't use them off-label, and they're, they're not being used in children yet. I'm Subri Subramanian from Department of Surgery. I'm also a cancer researcher in the Masonic Cancer Center. So I think I thought maybe someone should tie the bell to the cat, right? So we are all sitting here thinking about Moonshot. What is the plan that we have moving forward? Moonshot 60 years back was straightforward. It was single moon. We know the direction. We went there, right? But <laughs> cancer is a multiple hundreds of disease combined together as a single word. 
do we have a really have a plan? For example, we use some drugs which are 60 years old, doxorubicin, you name it, right? 60 years back, we discovered those things, we still use this day. We, don't, we have not much progress in the last 60 years. Moving forward, are we going to use the same approach that we did in the last 60 years? Or do we have any really good plans? Every year we spend $5 billion. We still fear cancer. Name a single person in this room who doesn't fear cancer, right? Why? What's the plan moving forward? I have no idea. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Subri. It, so um, obviously, I don't think we can answer that question. I think part of um, the only comment I would make, and we're going to take two more questions after this, is part of this whole national initiative, I think, needs I think part of this is a call to come together to answer the questions that you're raising, which is probably beyond the scope of what we have in this panel. But you know, we've all heard about this. If you Google moonshot, you come up with a lot of things, including good night moon now, apparently. <laughs> um, but, but that's really the, you know, this is a call to come together to exactly answer your questions. We're gonna take this question and then I have two additional ones and we'll see what the timing is since Obviously, we're enthusiastic, we can go forever, but let's take this one, and then I have one other one by Twitter, sorry, and let's, all right, we'll do these two, go ahead. <laughs> by Thank pressure. You. Thank you, my name's uh, Christopher Tostad, I'm a graduate student in bioinformatics. Uh, my question carries a comparable level of pessimism, unfortunately, but um, my question has to do with complications. Uh, we're at the advent of an incredibly revolutionary technology, and uh, much like many of the past technologies that have hit medicine um, that were revolutionary within themselves. We were very excited about what they can do and we've been talking about that, but uh, many decades down the line we see um, random things that kind of jump in and are tangential issues. So I think um, an analogy would maybe be like bioinf or, sorry, not bioinformatics, um, antibiotics and uh, the way that they were very important, but then we deal with uh, creating super bugs that are antibiotic resistant or, um, you know, the, the tangential problems with microbiome development and st <clears throat> stuff like that. Um, and when we talk about targeting aspects of a, of a tumor, um, are we going to create an immunotherapy resistant tumor or a cancer cell? So what are potential side effects that we might see down the yeah. line as uh, long-term immunotherapies take hold? Yeah. Thank you. I think it's a really great comment. I mean, I guess just for brevity, I would tell you that it is unequivocally clear in some of these chimeric antigen receptors that what we're targeting with immunotherapy is coming back with tumors that lack that antigen. So there's no question. You know, people are proposing dual targeted agents and there are probably other molecular mechanisms combined with immunotherapy combined with viruses. I am guessing, and you know, based on the history of cancer research, that no one single modality, even though we all have our passions for these things, is gonna solve the ultimate question. We'll take the last question so we can enter on time. Thank you. Thank you. I wanna give Dr. Orndry a chance to answer something. And that is, you said that there's five different University of Minnesota departments that are looking at HPV and how we should get more people vac vaccinated. I'm just wondering why the, derma, why the dental department that's just huge at the university isn't included in that, because we have a whole bunch of professionals in the state that can help us attack the, who else looks in the mouth as earnestly as dentists. And I just think you ought to get that department hooked in. So the... Uh... <laughs> Go ahead, Frank. <laughs> You have the last yeah. word there for this yeah. session. Yeah, so, so, so Nelson wrote us at the dental school and I have... Uh, had a oral cancer kind of a screening program for oral leukoplakias. The uh, issue with HPV, which I stuck to today, is the fact that we don't really have a precursor lesion that's, that you can visualize. So it will usually show up oftentimes as stage four disease with lymph nodes in the neck. But that being stated, there, through the uh, PBRN, the uh, Dental Based Resource Network that Don Nixdorf has at the dental school, he's one of the PIs for that. There is a, there's a national effort to try and strategize how to set up risk questionnaires by iPads to be able to try and figure out who should be screenable 
for HPV-associated malignancies. And in addition to that, there are some newly available uh, ultrasound-type probes that can be used transorally to find two or three millimeter potentially precursor lesions for HPV-associated malignancies. And we're a part of that trial as well, and that's with Brad Rindell at Health Partners, actually. So, uh, so not to completely deflect the comment, but that's, uh, you're involved, the dental school's involved, yeah. Thank you, Frank. So I'd like to thank the audience. Obviously, um, you know, as, as researchers, as patients, as advocates, as knowing somebody with cancer, we're all very passionate about this issue. Um, we're all actually on the same team. We do have a lot of questions, as Subri mentioned. We do have to see what's the end game, what's the deliverable of all this moonshot stuff. And I think that's what I'm hoping is going to be up and coming in the months to come. So I'd like to thank the panelists for being very thoughtful and passionate about what they do every day. You know, we've been doing the moonshot for more than 20 years, many of us, and we're going to go for another 20 or 30, we hope. <laughs> <laughs>